So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Randy Sprick. I am with Safe and Civil Schools. And um, with me are two of my colleagues with Safe and Civil Schools, Jacob Edwards, who I will turn it over to in just a moment, uh, and Jessica Sprick, my daughter, who is also with Safe and Civil Schools. And the three of us uh, represent really a broader range of our colleagues within Safe and Civil who uh, began working on thinking about this uh, probably in very early summer. And we began thinking about it largely because the time seems so right for our nation uh, to confront racial issues, racial inequities, um, and understanding that the depth of that goes back, of course, many centuries. So we are neither so naive or arrogant as to think that we can solve any of this quickly or that we can solve it at all. Uh, uh, we have been committed to school improvement and making schools positive places where there are no barriers to kids learning uh, for decades now, but we realized we want to go deeper as an organization and as the people within that organization, uh, specifically about equity and access, and specifically the time being so right for our uh, black friends, colleagues, family, students we serve, communities we serve, and as we began thinking about that and how can we deepen our own knowledge and skill, we realized perhaps being public with how we are going about learning might be worth doing. Uh, and this is, the, this is the outgrowth of that effort. And uh, we have four very esteemed colleagues who have spent their, their professional careers looking much more deeply at this than any of us at Safe and Civil uh, have been able to do. Uh, J uh, Jess, Jacob will introduce them, but I just wanna say a personal thank you to each of them and to everybody who's watching. These gracious individuals are volunteering their time to help us with this effort because they have such firm belief in the importance of all of this. And on behalf of Safe and civil, uh, we are deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jacob, uh, who's going to introduce them. What a privilege and honor it is to introduce uh, these folks on this panel. Not only do I know them professionally, but I've known them personally for many of years, and their work is authentic. Uh, their passion is palpable. And so it's just so great to, to engage on this journey with them, with some people who I consider dear colleagues and friends. And so uh, I'm gonna introduce them uh, formally, but I'm also gonna make some personal connections because I, <laughs> I love these folks right here. The first one, if you don't mind waving, I'm introducing Dr. John Lee Tungstall. Hello, hey girl, hey. All right, well, Dr. Tungstall is actually have been on the forefront of equity and access issues for dozens of years. Um, I know you look young, so do I. We first met in undergrad almost 20 years ago at UCLA where uh, to give you context, there were probably 5,000 students who were entered at UCLA. Out of that 5,000, 500 of them were African-American. Out of the 500 who were accepted, only 250 actually went. And John Lee and I represent the same class where we were two of 250. We graduated on time after that, she received her doctorate and has been uh, literally leading programs to actually provide equity, access, and inclusion into a top-notch university at UCLA. Uh, she is a professor of ethnomusicology, a co-founder of Sister Sister, where she advocates for uh, equity, access, and inclusion for women and African-American students or underrepresented populations uh, across the African diaspora. We're really proud of that. Uh, and I think one of the things that on a personal side that really connects us is we both entered into a program called Freshman Summer Program. That was to make sure that we not only made it to a top-notch university, but that we retained. And so I'm so proud to see so many years later, you are now at the helm of that program in the AAP at UCLA. So proud of you. Uh, so proud of all of your work. Thank you for your service and what you do. Second up, I would like to introduce Stephen Minnick. Stephen, can you wave to folks? Stephen Minnick is a legit rising star or was a legit rising star as an educational leader before his impact and his vision was too much to contain um, as he was leading the work in transforming a really 
underrepresented high school in Los Angeles, specifically Watts, California, called Lock High. Uh, and if you know anything about Lock High, uh, not only does it carry the murder rate of Los Angeles, but it was actually deemed in one study as a dropout factory. That's right. Prior to transformation, they coined Lock as a dropout factory. And Stephen was on the front line through athletics, through teaching with the students. Uh, I knew him personally there. I'm so sad that he left uh, before because he was he was masterful at speaking um, with students who were historically didn't really connect with individuals. I like to think of him as a child whisperer. And so uh, he's a lifelong educator who works in data mining and he was pulled out to co-found an organization called Up Matrix, where basically he mines data and he can speak to the disparities in that data. And he could speak to uh, the trends and from his perspective of his personal professional experience, his story is compelling, it's authentic. He knows the work. He knows it not only through K-12, but beyond and the business world. So we're so glad to have you, Steve. Hey, Minix. All right, next we want to introduce Chris Terry. Chris, can you wave at folks? Hey, Chris. Chris is actually an educator who started in the urban LA. She's worked in almost every community that is historically marginalized from uh, being a teacher in Compton <laughs> to, uh, we just need to figure out where you're going to work with Long Beach, but uh, from Compton to Inglewood, she was the founding assistant principal and principal in an East Los Angeles uh, high school, working with the charter management organization. She's done wonderful work. One of the highest ranking African-Americans in that organization, specifically women, uh, African-Americans in that organization, super proud of that fact. Personally, when I started as an educational leader, she took me under her wing. She was the first person who formally adopted me and explicitly taught me how to present professional development. For that, I will always be grateful. You are always an uh, advocate for equity, access, and inclusion, not only through your words, but your actions. So I salute you. We appreciate you. Now she's moved into the home office where she is actually broadening her reach from starting the organization's new teacher program and pipeline to where she's currently serving as a senior director for African American achievement and equity. What she's doing is she's trying to figure out those things that actually negatively impact students of color and trying to collaborate and facilitate discussion to help solve some problems um, in that community. So welcome aboard. All right, we, we also have Justin Patterson, uh, Dr. Justin Patterson, I like to refer to as JP. He is also a doctor at UCLA on the front lines. He's one of the top practitioners in equity, access, and inclusion at UCLA as well. Uh, his organization actually goes into inner city schools, provides free counseling. So not only we can recruit, but retain students of color. Uh, when people are running away, he's running to those destinations. On a personal level, he was my first boss at UCLA. He's someone who I actually try to pattern my leadership style after. I am so humbled uh, to work with him now and call him a colleague. As a matter of fact, all those years ago, old man, you were both Dr. Tungstos and I, boss. We appreciate your work. We love what you do. We not, we not only recognize you as a professor at UCLA, but also a person who is actually bridging the gap and trying to make sure that you make a difference when it comes to inclusion. So thank you so much. Give it up for Justin. I want to also introduce my writing partner, my colleague, right, Jessica Sprick, who is actually going to help moderate this conversation. Um, I am so proud to be able to say that I work with, but also work for the Spricks. Your words and actions are authentic, genuine, and consistent from not only what you do um, as far as professionally, but the way you walk and the way you talk and the way you treat people. And so I am so honored to be a part of this group. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Sprick does not like me to call him Dr. Sprick, but I will forever honor you, sir, because you are not only our founder of Safe and Civil Schools, you are my mentor, you are my friend, and you are my family member. And I give honor where honor is due, so you will always be Dr. Sprick. You birthed us all. 
I'm so proud to be a representative of so many colleagues at Safe and Civil Schools and Encora Publishing because you are a great inspirational leader to us all. So can we, just, can we just stop right there, Jacob? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Okay. Please. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in, in, in. Uh, <laughs> so at this point, I just want to say welcome aboard. I am passionate. As you can see, I'm fired up. This is a great panel. Uh, I would love to pass it to my colleague, Jessica, uh, so that we can continue with the norms. All right, well, uh, thank you, Jacob, for those wonderful introductions. And uh, just to give a special shout out to you for all of the work and the investment um, that, that you do every day in our work with Safe and Civil Schools, but especially the thought and care that has been put into working with us to design this panel um, and uh, bringing together a phenomenal group of educators. We wanted to make sure that for this first conversation, and, and it is going to be an ongoing conversation, uh, that, we, that we were speaking with people who don't have as much direct affiliation with Safe and Civil Schools as an organization, because we really do want to use this as an opportunity to think about what do we hopefully already do some things well, but how do we grow? How do we move as an organization towards helping schools, but also evaluating our own practices at Safe and Civil School to move towards more equity and more equitable practices and ensuring that our schools are places where our Black students, where all students can thrive. Um, and so one of the things that we we spent a lot of time with, and, and Jacob and Randy especially, um, the, the three of us really digging into trying to think about what are the norms that we want to use to guide this conversation as well as any subsequent ones. And so part of uh, what we hope to establish at Safe and Civil Schools is models for practices that as you are going into this journey as a school system, as a school itself, uh, that you can that you can think about establishing some ground rules for ensuring that these conversations are productive. So Randy, Randy, Jacob, and I actually uh, filmed a more in-depth discussion. It's about 20 minutes long, and I believe in the registration email for this uh, particular session, uh, we included a link to that uh, video, but we'll also put it up on the YouTube channel. Just for purposes of time, we're just going to go real quickly through the norms that we identified, but we did share them with all of the panelists. We asked for feedback, uh, just again, wanting to, to set some, some basic expectations for how we can function as a panel as we're diving into some really critical but potentially difficult discussion. So I'm going to share real quickly here um, and just walk us through uh, some brief bullet points of the norms that we identified. So the first one, and Jacob, I have to give a real shout out to you on this because I think I hear you continually coming back to this idea of granting each other grace, that when we're having difficult conversations, we have to hear each other's hearts, not necessarily always the words that are coming out of each other's mouths, and then in order to make these conversations ongoing and opportunities for growth, we have to be willing to grant each other all grace. Um, the second one is the recognition that uh, this is a journey, not a destination, and this is going to require ongoing work, ongoing reflection, ongoing uh, commitment to drive actions to, to address issues of equity and issues of race in our schools. Um, and so with that, that we're going to have open and continued conversations. And I think uh, we really tried to ensure that with this panel that they felt free to speak from all aspects of their experience to be able to really push into a very difficult questions questions and difficult issues, and that it is the start of what we hope is going to be a much more ongoing and broader conversation. Um, we also wanted to ensure that because of the, the difficult nature and the entrenched nature of many of, of the topics that we're going to be discussing, that we keep our mind on the idea of hope, that we can acknowledge the difficulty, we can acknowledge the magnitude of the problems as we start discussing issues of equity, uh, but that we're committed to the work and the belief that if we continue to take small actions and work towards larger actions, that over time we're going to be able to create hopefully major change within our systems. Uh, we also identified that if we're not a part of the solution, we're a part of the problem. And so uh, the idea that inaction is actually an action in itself and that we are all going to be looking for what are meaningful actions that are within our locus of control. Uh, part of the, the purpose of this panel uh, is to be thinking about how we at Safe and Civil Schools can, can use our platform with educators to try and elevate ideas um, about how we can tackle these very, very broad challenges. 
Um, to have the conversations and do the work, we also know that we have to have meaningful relationships that allow us to see each other's hearts. And so we've really tried to establish in some pre-work with the panelists, but also in our in our uh, internal group at Safe and Civil Schools, uh, meaningful relational trust, uh, which also goes to this last one that we do not by any means want to ever be making light of the barriers of the challenges uh, related to race and equity, but that humor and laughter is medicine for the di this difficult work. And so that if we can be infusing humor into our discussions with each other and finding ways to continue building and deepening those relationships, it makes this all a much more productive conversation. So with that, I'm going to stop our share. And uh, we had an interesting discussion yesterday as we were just trying to consider kind of the arc of this conversation and um, ended up landing on, you know what, let's just hit the most pressing sort of prominent question uh, that hopefully is on everyone's minds as they enter this panel. Uh, we're going to we're going to start with a punch. So our first question that I'd like to pose to the panel um, is that schools are getting ready to come back in some way, shape or form, whether that's virtual or some hybrid model or face-to-face, -face. Um, but many things have happened since we were last in session with our students that uh, we really do seem to have reached what I hope is a tipping point um, in the wake of George Floyd's killing, in the wake of subsequent protests, um, and that there seems to be more willingness, more awareness at this point on the part of our broader system as a whole to be starting to dig into questions of inequity that have always been there, but perhaps the willingness and readiness and the commitment uh, was not yet at a point where we could dig into uh, what are meaningful actions that we can take. And, and in my work with schools, one of the things that I've noticed is that discussions of equity have been cropping up frequently as schools are considering reopening, but really from a perspective of things like access to technology, that we have barriers that are in place related to issues of race and equity and poverty in terms of access to technology technology and access to being able to engage in virtual learning. Um, I've heard less consideration and discussions around the question of how are we preparing to return to school, willing and ready to address current events, willing and ready to address what has occurred over the course of this summer that we haven't seen our students uh, during all of the protests, during all of this increased awareness, increased discussion. And those those discussions may be having, happening with families, may be happening internally with communities, but that if we miss the moment as schools, our subsequent work on equity may not, we may miss the mark. And so my first question that I'd like to pose to the panelists is, what recommendations do you have for schools to try to prepare their educators uh, to try to think about how to engage in meaningful discussions and dialogues with their communities and with their students of color. I, I drew the short straw, folks, so <laughs> I'm going first. Um, thanks for Thank you, Stephen. Of course, sincerely happy to be here. And I just wanna add one, one quick caveat before I jump in. We focus more on impact analytics vote versus data mining, and that's a different lens. And, and you'll understand why in some of my answers in a little bit. But Jacob, you my guy, don't worry. Um, I'm a dad, right? So for me, this is supremely personal. I'm a black man who's a dad. I hope that any school that my kids come back into, they're checking in with those little humans first. I, I don't care about your math pedagogy right now. I care about the fact that my kid's world was rocked, right? May or March 13th, kids got stuck inside. My second grader, my kindergartner, and my one-year-old world were rocked. That is not unique to me, right? And now those kids, some of them have been stuck inside in places that are not wonderfully available to facilitate learning, right? So we got to think about the mental awareness, the mental fragility. We got to think about the physical tumult. There's a lot of stuff going on here that, that needs to be reexamined when young people come back to school for the teachers too, right? Like this, <laughs> don't get it twisted. This isn't just affecting kids. My wife's a school leader. Right? I see the pain that, that educators are carrying right now, trying to solve this moving issue. And, but I'll take it back to something I know well, which is Jacob said that I'm a kid whisperer. And I trust me, I will put that somewhere in my resume somewhere because that's kind of how I think of it a little bit. But I had a teacher a long time ago, Mr. Ball, in my favorite class in high school was Current World Issues, CWI. Right? And it's because we talked about what was happening that day. And it helped me understand where I fit in the world that day, right? And so whether it's 
high school, college, or my little kindergartner going to first, we better be dialing in with the young person and figuring out where they are and helping them get to where we want to go. And thankfully, the world has woken up to some of this social plight um, and, and now has created a little a, a gap for us to, to lean in and really bring thoughtful conversation um, as well as continued conversation. We're not going to visit this for one talking point. Right. Make this a part of the fabric moving forward. So that's what I'm hoping for when my babies go back to school. Um, um, or if I'm going to be helping them understand that while they're home, we got to make sure we're leveraging the current opportunities to really make this real for them. And then we can fit in the other stuff along the way. Um, that's the way I'm going to approach it. I'd like to um, quickly just piggyback on what uh, Steven said. Um, first, I'll start here. I'm, I'm the son of pastors and teachers and grew up in a black church. So before I get started, I just wanna elevate the names of many of the people who um, are responsible for us being here. George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, and then even those who came before them, uh, the Tamir Rices and Trayvon Martins and Sandra Blands and Freddie Grays, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, um, Oscar Grant, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, I think, you know, while we mourn their, the, you know, their passing, uh, in, in many cases, their murder, uh, you know, one of the things that gives me hope is the fact that, you know, we find ourselves in this place today. Um, you know, they, they, they're, they're dying while unfortunate, while, more than unfortunate, while tragic. Um, was not in vain because we're able to have these kind of, these difficult conversations now in a way that maybe we wouldn't have had had those things not happened. Um, and I, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to take a look at something that my wife sent me this morning uh, because I think it's very appropriate to what we're talking about um, right now. It was an article in one of you know everyone's favorite journals. Uh, everyone reads it all the time. It's called Sports Illustrated. Uh, and you know the 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 interviewer, the author was interviewing a young man who's being recruited to go to college, um, and you know they were asking him about his recruitment process. And in the article, uh, the young man said the conversations that stuck out to me the most were the conversations that I didn't have. Um, some coaches kind of avoided it, and they were talking about whether or not they were, you know, whether anyone was asking about what's going on in the world. He said, some coaches kind of avoided it and acted like it's not going on. They say they care about me, but if you really care about me, you should know that what is going on today affects me on a personal level. Um, you should want to talk about that. You should want to see how I feel about if you really uh, see about that, if you care about me, not just me as an athlete. And so, you know, when I think about, you know, the, the return to school and, and what it really means, you know, I, I think about that quote because it, it has so much meaning to me. Um, I think oftentimes as educators, all of us, we, we see our students and, and, and what we see are young people who we're supposed to, um, you know, give some information and maybe they, they take it and do something with it, right? And, and, you know, to Stephen's point, which I think was very appropriate, the first place we have to start is with the humanity of the people that we're working with. And if we don't start there and understand that people will have needs before they, you know, as a, I have needs as a person before I have need of your content. And if you don't meet my needs as a person first, and you know, we all have need to, to feel cared for, um, to be respected, to feel valued and all of those things. And so to come back to school and to not interrogate what's going on, to not have conversations about what's going on, to not check in with students before you get to uh, you know, the topic of the day. And then not only that, but not check in once, but have a continuous kind of process for checking in. If you're not doing that, then you're going to miss your students. I have you know, um, three sons. I won't name which one of my sons uh, you know, that I'm talking about now, because uh, they'll kill me. And I used to hate when my parents used to talk about me when they were preaching. Um, but one of my sons, you know, during this whole, you know, all the civil unrest, you know, he came out of his room one day and he was crying. He was crying because, you know, the, some of the comments of even his classmates uh, that were so insensitive to what's going on. Uh, he goes to independent school. 
most of his classmates are um, are white, and they they didn't know how to deal with him as a, a black man in that space and and having to live through what's going on. Um, and so, you know, to go back to school, to have classmates who may not understand, and then your teachers and administrators also don't uh, work through these things alongside you, um, I think would be a, a grave mistake. And it's, it's a way, I think, for you to continue to push students out of the educational process because they'll, they'll see you not as an ally, but in many cases, they'll start to see you as a foe and as an impediment. And I think that's a huge challenge that our, our young people face. You know, I, just to piggyback on that, you know, as, as I think about how educators need to show up, uh, to your point about being an ally, I, I think it's a, we have a tendency uh, as teachers to always be in teach mode. And I think there's a time and place to sometimes give just enough uh, common language for students to talk and then get out of the way and start listening. I think our kids need to have the space to speak to their confusion and their pain and their concern. To your point, my nine-year-old son came to me. Uh, you know, we have the news on. He knows what's, what's happening as much as we try to uh, shield him from some things. And uh, just said, mommy, this is so unfair. And he asked me, why would police treat us like that? And it, it's such an innocent yet profoundly difficult question to answer uh, for a child. That said, I think it's important that as adults, as adult educators, we come with a sense of humility a sense of vulnerable, vulnerability, uh, y'all know what I'm saying, uh, vulnerability uh, when we're engaging students and listening to them because we don't have all the answers. We don't need to have answers. We, we don't need to teach them everything about um, institutional racism right after a, a very dehumanizing and uh, traumatizing event happens. Sometimes we need to just come and say, you know what, we don't have it figured out either. We're hurting too, but I'm here because I care, because I love you, because I wanna hear what you're going through. And if I think about that, one of the things that we found in actually um, doing what we called a processing lesson with, with our students, which was a lesson just, just again, just enough information to same page and give you space to talk and, and express your feelings, is that uh, when we did that, there was so much, um, we created an opportunity for solidarity to happen. So many of our black children are growing up alongside, um, in many cases, the student population, uh, uh, we serve or I serve, um, other students in poverty, students of color, and just giving them space to talk and express their feelings and their hopes and their desires. It, it, it's, it's this great opportunity to hear students, um, Latinx students and other students talk about when you hurt, I hurt. We did a little survey and, I, and, and a, uh, one of the students said, I want my classmates to know when you hurt, um, I hurt. Now, if we had more adults, let's be clear, in this world thinking like that, we wouldn't be in half the mess we're in. But that said, um, just providing the opportunity and the space for children to talk and, and to be heard, um, I think creates an opportunity for um, things to happen that can help heal us. Can, uh, can I uh, interject a, a question here, um, or maybe just um, requesting a, a clarification? Um, 
in part, uh, this is because um, uh, Jessica has done really, really deep work in the issue of absenteeism. And so we've, we've been looking at uh, some issues about absenteeism and how to address that. Uh, but one of the things that, that we identified is that some of the people who are uh, really very uh, appropriately concerned about absenteeism uh, express many of the same things, which I totally agree with what, what Stephen, Chris, and Justin said here, uh, allowing a voice for students and so on, that it was almost like people were saying, let's spend six hours a day talking about the issues. And it's like we, we, we also, for educators who will have to be making decisions about how to do this, those aren't going to be easy decisions. If, for example, kids are physically going to be with us and a high school or middle school teacher has six periods a day, that may mean that students have six different teachers who are perhaps not making the class compelling uh, because we're just giving opportunities to talk or whatever. So uh, can you kind of, and, and, and perhaps also maybe thinking about the difference for what this, this might mean, um, Stephen, for your five-year-old, Chris, for your nine-year-old, and Justin, for your, your children who are adolescent and uh, above, uh, there are probably differences in context there for how to create that sense of safety. Could any of the four of you speak to some of those issues? I'll just start off by saying oftentimes it's not a complete day in every class and spending an entire entire day at dialogue, but providing enough space to say, I see you and I know what's happening impacts you and starting off with a check-in. Um, this conversation, what keeps ringing for me is this idea of those who buy into this notion of a colorblind society and I don't see color, but we know that in fact, by saying I don't see color means I don't see you. And I think it becomes a blatant neglect to not acknowledge that what's happening politically, racially, socially in our country impacts you at the K through 12, through 16, through 20 level, you have to acknowledge that reality. And so it may not be taking the entire class every single period, but to at least do a check-in, to take a pulse of genuinely, how are you doing? To provide space to say, I recognize what's happening and I know that it may impact some of you and I wanted to just give space to do a check-in and to know that this space that that's allowed we're not going to ignore it we may not be able to have a full conversation but I want to simply check in because I see and I know and I acknowledge and that often is more powerful and I think Dr. Patterson's work deals a lot with care and that's a way of acknowledging and bringing into existence the fact that I see you and I care and I'm giving you space now to in some way to be able to voice that. Dr. S Dr. Sprick, I was gonna jump in on that uh, to the question for me. I think about when I've tried to do anything when I've been hungry, right? And for me, there's a, there's a inner hunger and I mean this metaphorically now. And if you as an educator dare sit in front of me today and tell me that you want me to go on a journey with you, Justin called this out, right? And you haven't invested in me beyond the me as a commodity in your game of teaching me something. I mean, that's, that's just, that's going to be to me extremely a toned up approach unless you have a ridiculous relationship built up with these students where they can be like, yo doc, I, I see you, but right. And so for my, my, I think about my daughters, right? I guarantee you if, if, if a teacher, if their teacher dared talk to them about something not related to this and they came home, they would bring that to me quick. Daddy, we guess what we did. We made whatever they're going to, they they want to have these conversations. Now you just got to think about how you bring it down, excuse me, not down, how you bring it to them. So where they can get in and they can understand, they can feel it. But yeah, uh, John Lee, Absolutely not a, a marathon of, of just continued talk, 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 right? But I know that whenever I was told, Minix, I'm here, man, come talk to me. That was enough a lot of the time. Like I just knew I could go spit with somebody. That, 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 that tells me like, okay, okay, I, I, I got somebody I can go lean on. And so that's kind of where I would go with it. Um, but but it, I, I just think we would, and I could only think about the, the, the problems would be created by a teacher missing the opportunity to check in with their kids now 
man, that would make for a very difficult school year because I'm gonna sit in your class and I'm gonna be looking at you to prove that your actions that first couple of days were a mistake on your part, not, you know, not, uh, not uh, the, 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 the rule that moving forward. And I think it's tough, it's a juggle and I get that it is tough, but checking in has to be the priority right now, in my opinion. And I think it happens throughout the course of the year, right? right? It's not like, okay, it's first week or first day we were back and we, we have this quick little check-in and then, okay, great. I, I did my part, wash my hands, move on. Um, it really has to, like, I mean, we all know this intuitively, right? Relationships take effort. Um, and, you know, you you can't build that relationship in a moment, and but you can absolutely tear it down, you know, you know with one decision. Um, and so it's really being willing as an educator uh, to invest the time over a span of time um, to, to show your students that you care about them as people first. Um, and, you know, the, Dr. Tunstall referenced my, you know, my work around care and, and there's so much evidence that, you know, when, when students just have someone on campus who they know they can go to when they have a problem, right, who, who recognizes and notices when they weren't there, right, that those things have significant impact on, on all kind of academic outcomes, you know, academic engagement, sense of belonging, um, resilience, all those things are impacted by having adults on campus who care about them. And, and you know, so, uh, you know, just like my colleagues have said, if we miss that opportunity and then continue to miss it throughout the year, then, I mean, you, you've lost, you've lost the game already. And I mean, it, it's our job to bring them along with us. Um, and, and, you know, in, in some, it, it does take more effort than just sitting down and saying, I'm teaching algebra, so you're gonna get this algebra from me. And if you don't like it, then that's on you. I have my job, right? Like if you want to be an educator who's making a difference, right? And there's, there's obviously the difference between, I guess, you know, people who are just, who are teachers and people who are educators. I think an educator is somebody who's really gonna invest that time beyond, I just teach a subject, right? I'm an educator, I'm gonna, I'm going to invest in you, I'm going to, lead you along the way. I'm going to, you know, my personal belief is that educators are, are leaders just like in corporate America or anything else. And I believe that any leader's responsibility is to create the context for, for the people they're leading to be successful. Um, you can't create that context if, if, if you're not open enough to, you know, to, to me being who I am, to me being human and showing me um, that you value who I am. I, I think also to your question, uh, Dr. Sprick, uh, you know, about a child going from classroom to classroom and, and you know, kind of repeating the conversation. I, I think what I would hope is that um, we don't just have islands of care, but that school teams get together and talk about, um, strategize, if you will, how are we going to create um, the sense of community we need to create to have these conversations. Not everybody, uh, not every educator is comfortable. Uh, you know, they're comfortable showing their, their love and regard, but when we get into deeper issues of race and racism um, and, and anti-Blackness for sure, not everybody's equipped. But if we're taking a communal approach to serving our kids, and we're collaborating and talking about, well, I'm gonna take this role in meeting the needs of kids. And sometimes kids, you know, my son, he can go only so far in having these kind of conversations. And when he's checked out and done, he is done and he's ready to move on. And so we need pay people prepared to handle that. So, so what I, I guess I would hope is that um, we take a, again, a, a more communal approach to ensuring that we're the meeting the needs of, uh, of children in this context and not leave it solely up to individual educators to feel like they have to be um, the only support and answer for their kids. 
And Chris, I think um, you know that's a that's actually a real nice transition because I know that we we really wanted to take some time to address the importance of this moment and what are we doing to support our students as they come back to school and not missing not missing that mark, not ignoring or pretending like like current events are not happening and that our students are in a place where they need us to make those connections, but that we also tie it to the broader systems that we have currently and analyzing where are our systems at trying to identify where are places where we are letting our students down or where we have not addressed head on supports that we need to take. Uh, so so in setting up this panel, I know we kind of talked about uh, issues of awareness. How do we start to to drive meaningful data collection, meaningful analysis, meaningful discussions with our students to identify uh, where we need to do the work? followed up by meaningful actions. And so, so as we start thinking about some of those systems questions, I'm, I'm gonna talk from a personal perspective as, as a parent myself. Um, my, my kids are tri-racial. So I am half Japanese, half Caucasian, uh, and my husband is black originally from Ghana. Um, and it has been so eye-opening to me as someone who has gone through the US school system being largely considered white um, because of the color of my skin. Um, now trying to think about the lessons that I need to teach my tray racial children, who many people are looking at and immediately identifying them as black, that there are lessons that I as a parent am having to learn because I haven't lived it in my own experience. So I can relate that to, uh, you know, the, the lessons that are going to be different in terms of how I teach my kids how to drive and how they're going to need to be prepared to interact with police while driving. Um, you know, the first time that my husband and I were driving in a rural area, you know, him telling me, please don't pull over at this gas station, let's get to the next big city and that not being within my frame of reference. And so I think that that becomes a powerful place to think about what are the lessons that our Black parents are having to teach their Black children that they shouldn't have to teach, that parents of white kids don't even have to think about, and that that becomes a powerful place to start poking holes in equity, <laughs> that if we're having to teach these lessons that parents shouldn't have to teach about how to survive in our school system, that becomes a powerful starting place to say now, how do we work to address those lessons and changing the system in a way that our parents no longer have to teach those. So can any of you kind of speak to what are some of those lessons that our white parents may not be aware of that our black parents are having to teach our kids about surviving in the US system? Can, can I jump in and uh, remind uh, one of the panelists? I remember Justin, you and I were sitting together when Mike Brown, um, the news broke. And I remember looking at you and the first question we looked at each other, we said, where was his dad? It was, it, was, it was really, where was his dad to teach him, you don't walk in the middle of the street and you comply. And I think about 30 minutes later, we sat back and we said, we are educators, we understand this. And that was where our mind went. And I remember we looking at each other and didn't realize how conditioned we were to learning lessons, right? To, to, to teaching just to blend in and survive. And so I want from that place, I think we sometimes call it the talk. What are the talks that we're having um, uh, uh, with our kids? I think that it would be enlightening if any of you can speak to that. I just remember that experience and us looking at each other almost in shame. Like, is that really what, we've, what our first thought was? Um, and that's because we, we've internalized these lessons. We practice getting pulled over. We, we practice how to comply. We practice where to put our wallets. Um, so, you know, that's from an African-American male perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of intersectionality. I'm learning about that more often where, where these margin, where, where these issues uh, uh, come up. But I also want to expand that to like, what, what, what are the talks you all have? It would be great for, for me to hear and also uh, our broader community. I'll just speak quickly because we have some parents who are having these conversations literally in this moment but I have a friend who's watching and in this moment is texting like the lessons how not to get killed by the police how to have friends who won't microaggress you throughout your entire schooling experience moments when you have to be silenced because if you speak up people will think it's strange how to not be silenced throughout your entire life black girls they're going to over sexualize you even at the age of five and how to deal with what that means on your self, your identity throughout your entire life and how you're comfortable with your body. 
she just keeps going on and on because these are conversations that are happening and then you have to then deal with them as an adult when those conversations haven't happened, but lessons you're having to learn and undo along the way that impact literally how you operate as a professional, how you make friends, how you deal with the fact that hmm, my entire life I've been surrounded by people and I have students who talk about their parents when I visited them every single week and being one a few black kids at my school who made me feel like I was ugly, who made me feel like I wasn't enough. So how to instill in my child that you're beautiful despite that folks were talking about your hair or that no one else looks like you. So even in talking about the different, for Jacob, you talked about how it may look different for black men or black women. There are often experiences that are the same, but even in dealing with identity and ideas of beauty and dealing with others that don't look like you on a consistent basis or advocating for yourself, when others think that you're somehow intellectually inferior. Those are just some things that are hot off the press, even as you ask the question, Jessica. You know, and I'll, I'll just jump in there um, because something jean Lee just said that uh, struck me. I learned early on the importance of, of advocating for myself. And it was a lesson that my parents taught me um, because of experiences that I had myself being a, a, a product of Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, without getting into all of the details, I, I, I vividly recall my chemistry teacher in 11th grade um, and would come into class and regularly would berate us as students. Um, his perspective was my job is to fail as many of you as I can. Um, it's your job to figure out how to pass my class, um, which, you know, that's not even the, the, the bad stuff. Uh, the bad stuff was you know, telling us as young black men in the classroom that, you know, I know that none of you guys have dads. Um, and he even, he went so far one time, and this is what uh, prompted my parents to show up at the school, uh, was he, he said, you know what, I was visiting your mom this weekend and, you know, I was playing with, and you can insert uh, lady parts. And like he legitimately said that and then pretended like he was talking about a, a kitty, a kitty cat. Um, I told my parents because, I mean, th that's just how I was raised. I was like, you're not going to talk to me like that. And then give me a bad grade, right? Like, like we're going to deal with this. Um, and so I, I recall my mom calling the principal, um, setting up a meeting, uh, having my dad change some flight plans because she wanted to make sure that my black father showed up at the meeting with this man who said that I didn't have a black daddy. Um, and, and but, but the reason I bring this story up is because I learned then how important it is uh, to teach your kids to advocate um, and, and how important it is for, for our kids to know that they don't have to, you know, in, in you know, this system, just accept any kind of treatment. And so when I think about the lessons that I try to instill in my children, um, you know, it, it, I'm sure many of them are similar to my fellow panelists and, and probably many of you who are um, viewing this, you know, this idea of, you know, people are paying more attention to you than they might some of your peers. And so you have to always be on your P's and Q's. It, you know, school is a microcosm of what takes place in society, right? Just like, um, you know, we talk about having those conversations about how to deal with the police. It's unfortunate that in a schooling environment, Oftentimes, and I don't want to offend any teachers, but oftentimes teachers and administrators uh, are just like the police uh, on the street, right? Where um, there's this preconceived notion of who, I think about black boys, I think about identifying, and my wife better than I can clearly identify when they went from being cute little boys, just cute boys, to being black young men. And that happens maybe in third or fourth grade, believe it or not. You know, you hit about 10, you're no longer a cute little boy, but now you're a, a young black man and you can see the shift in many, uh, in the way many teachers uh, in, engage with, with, you know, these young men. And so I think my conversation really is about uh, making sure that you you do what you're supposed to do, right? But then, you keep other people in line. Don't let anybody step on you. And if they do and you can't handle it, you tell me because I'll come handle it for you. Right. Like, um, and, and, you know, it's a I think that's a 
it's a difficult thing, a, di a difficult road for a child to walk, right? And, and there have been times when my son didn't want me to come advocate for him, right? Um, because, you know, who wants your parents involved? But again, it's teaching. It's the same way my parents taught me back when I was in 11th grade chemistry. You know, I'm teaching him, you know, who, who he's supposed to be even when he's a dad, right? Like, you show up when those things happen. And so I think that's one of the big lessons uh, that, that, you know, that I try to instill in my kids. You know, Jess, uh, I want to push you on that thought, though. I think uh, you not only were taught to advocate, but you actually had skills. Uh, you went to quality, you had quality educators who tried to balance the tension between giving you soft skills to advocate and technical skills to, to, to express yourself. Uh, one of the things that, that we noticed, and for those of you who work with, with us in, the, the, in, in South LA, what we notice is that a lot of our kids are passionate, but without skills. Um, and that's what I'm concerned. I hope that uh, by creating space, I'm curious on how do we balance the tension between creating space, um, being compassionate uh, versus being complicit and allowing kids not to, to develop skills because we wanna give them so space. So what we see that sometimes translates into is a culture of low expectations because we want to make sure you feel heard, right? And so uh, you can feel heard, we can expose you to what's going on, but without uh, uh, giving you the skills in that, congratulations, now you're just gonna walk out without any follow-up. You're causing noise, which is, is at times needed, but you don't have skills to back that up and to articulate your space. I know your educational background, you not only had advocacy, but you had skills. My thought is, is what are your thoughts, panelists, on teachers, I can see teachers good in, intense, uh, intentions, listening to you saying, let's create spaces for kids. Let, let's let them know, uh, but we're going to create so much space that we don't get back to giving them the skills. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I would tell you real quick, and I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, but I would tell you that um, then you're not caring for them if you um, are not holding them to high expectations, right? Like part of the equation is also like, you can't care for me and then have no expectation of me. Um, th that to me is not care. That is, um, like you said, that's you being complicit in, in my underdevelopment, right? So if you really care for me, then you will give me the space to, you know, advocate for myself, to, to have the converse, the critical conversations that I need to have um, around what's going on in the world. But at the same time, um, you're going to set high expectations for me and you're also going to create the, again, you're gonna create the conditions where I can meet those high expectations. Because setting a high expectation without putting the, the, you know, the necessary support and other things around me to meet that expectation is, is can oftentimes be dooming me for, fa for failure. And that's a, that's a missed opportunity as well. So if you're, you know, if you're giving so much space that you're not going to demand that I perform then, then you're failing me in that regard as well, right? So you're right. It is a it's a balancing act between those those two things, but it absolutely can be done, and I, I would I would contend that it has to be done if we care about these children. I'm gonna jump in there, Jacob. Um, yeah, this is all done with co-created high expectations, right? I think a lot of times teachers try to prescribe expectations on kids and don't bring the kid into that idea. That's just the problem. They don't. They, they assume you know, or teachers assume they know what a kid's expectations or ceiling can be. You know how you can ask me what my ceiling is? Ask me. Ask me as a kid, right? And then when I say something and you, it differs with what you're saying, pull me along if, if, if what I'm seeing in myself is low. But I think one thing I benefited from, and my dad left this earth way too early, right? Southern black military man left the world in 92. A lot of what I do today is trying to fill in the gap from this man who left the world too early. I know what it's like to be, to have a guidepost, to have a true North, right? And what I wanted to be for young people is some kind of a guidepost, not a, rep, not a, not a replacement, but like a, just a guidepost. And just to show you that you can watch me walk around Watts in these PE uniform that I wear as a PE teacher and still build a, a relationship with everybody in the community. I remember talking to kids about that. I got one of my coworkers who, who's one of my guys, Michael McKelvin out of Locke High School that now helps run our company, right? Mike and I talk all the time about 
yo, man, when you when you're 27 and you're stomping around into into you know government offices and telling them how they can allocate money, I can't wait to watch you dance and do your thing. We talk about it today. He can't be in this session today because him and his wife are spending time. He said, I can't wait to watch the recording, coach. Right. But my expectations for Mike were really high, but not as high as Mike's and himself. Right. So I think there's a way to kind of really inspire and everything that we have to do as educators, even me as one that's no longer acting like one day to day. If inspiration isn't a part of your concoction to develop young people, then you're missing the point, Jack. You just are. Like you have to inspire people. Like I need inspiration right now and I'm a passionate driven person. But the way this world is spinning right now, I'm looking for it. Big shout to this group because I'm getting some of it here. So I know that's kind of a tangential, but what I was trying to get at is there's never a conversation that I'm gonna have with anybody on this planet that doesn't involve high expectations and your ability to outperform what you think you can do. And I'm gonna help you do it. I'll be your, your stepping stone or I'll, you know, whatever the case may be, but that has to be a part of this. I mean, I don't like to use the soft bigotry of low expectations line too often, but it is real. It is very real. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't like to look, use it is because of the source it came from way back, but it's, it's a legit statement, right? Um, you have to keep the bar high, but you also have to collaborate on that process, That's, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I, I, I agree, Stephen. And I think uh, when, when I think about the bar, uh, having a high bar, high expectations for students uh, and the question of skill, uh, I often grapple with is, is the skill really my end goal? for kids. And, and I think um, having high in expectations for impact is something that uh, is critical for our children. You know, they, they're not just waiting for somebody to come along and pour something into them and fix them and, and, and save them from something. Uh, there is untapped, um, unacknowledged brilliance within our kids, even where skill gaps exist. And, and so I often wonder, um, and again, grapple with how do we uh, set a high expectation for your impact in the world around you? In, in whatever way you choose to have that impact, I'm not gonna dictate that to you. Um, because I think the, the battle oftentimes is, is students not necessarily uh, being inspired by skill development. But when we um, help them realize their purpose and help them realize opportunities to uh, impact other people around them, then there's a reason for me to develop those skills and to activate uh, some different types of uh, academic muscles or, or, or my, my literary muscle or my artistic muscle, whatever it is that you're trying to develop. And so I, I would just encourage us to think about when we're setting high expectations, how do we set the bar at uh, the ultimate impact you're gonna have uh, using the skills uh, that we actually want you to develop? In one of the programs that I lead, VIP Scholars, part of the work is around preparing high school students to be competitive for, for college, but a huge part of it is also preparing them to be social justice advocates. And so in exposing them to a social justice curriculum, here's what's wrong in the world, but then how to equip them with the skill set to be able to address what's happening. So speaking to your skill set question, Jacob, part of it is how to advocate for themselves in their school, how to advocate for more resources for their peers and even for their community. Some ways in which that happened is legit doing role playing with them. And so presenting them with scenarios that walk through, what if you encounter a teacher who refuses to give you an AP or honors class or thinks that you can't go to college, you won't go. A teacher who thinks because you're a black student, you didn't write this paper. A school won't, your school doesn't have books or computers. How do you advocate as a student for this? And so it's really going through role playing with them, what to say, when to tag in a parent or guardian, when to tag in a mentor, and then going through the same kind of scenarios with their family member or an adult figure in their life when you 
are addressed and you have to tag in because your student has reached such opposition, how can you then respond? What do you need to know? And then when do you need to escalate it and take it to someone beyond the teacher or the principal? And so this skill set piece of it is an important part and it may not just be talking about it, but having to even go through, here's what you can say, here's what's within your wheelhouse, within your power as a student, as a family member, and when do you need someone else's support in being able to advocate? Dr. Tunstall, thank you so much for, I think you kind of bookended this segment for me. We first started talking about this culture of I don't see color. I think that we have to see people in order to value them. Speaking of what we were talking about of what we have to do, the lessons taught, that means our kids are coming to us with skills. They have skills. They think about all that, that we're, we are bringing to the table by navigating a world that is unseen for most. So they're coming to us with skills. To your point, Minix, now that I value relationships and I co-collaborate, I see the person first. I now understand and recognize they have skills. I collaborate with that and I build off of what skills they bring to the table. And I think that comes back to what you were talking about. Let's leverage what you come with because it's just because it's not presented in a way that I, according to the traditional education, will perceive it, I now can help balance advocacy and skills. So that was a lesson that I've learned from all of you trying to connect from the beginning to end. I'm going to turn it over to my dear colleague, Jess. Any final thoughts? Well, we knew when we when we set up this panel, we wanted to, to make it a manageable chunk of time given everyone's reality that we're living in right now where people are juggling a thousand different responsibilities all from home. So we decided let's make this an hour and 10 minutes, but we knew that was not gonna be enough time. And I know that we've only just started uh, kind of tip of the iceberg in in this discussion. And so so I did wanna let people know, let our, let our audience know that um, Steve and Justin, Chris, John Lee have graciously agreed that once we sign off of this session with all of you, we're actually logging into a different Zoom uh, with no audience, but we're going to continue the conversation and we're going to record that so that, uh, you know, John Lee, I loved that, that right at the end there, you were giving us such concrete, meaningful actions that we can be that we can be putting in place in our schools to try and help students learn these self-advocacy skills, learn who they can go to and when is it appropriate. And so I think we really, really want to, to make sure that we end our time with you uh, digging into those impactful conversations about what are meaningful actions that our schools can put in place now uh, to start making a difference in supporting our black students. Uh, so with that, um, I am going to just do a little bit. I also want to honor all of our panelists and uh, share some of the work that they're doing and also how any of you uh, can connect with them. If you're interested in learning more about their work or interested in continuing this conversation, they've all graciously agreed to share contact information information as well. Uh, so give me just a moment here. We're going to share some quick slides. We will also send out all of this information uh, via email to all of you who have registered. Uh, so Stephen, um, I'm going to open it up to you sh to share with us any of the information on this particular slide. Uh, for those of you who are viewing, uh, if you are on a computer and you've got the ability to take a screenshot so that you've got this contact information, or you're on a you've got a phone that you could take a quick picture. Uh, if you are interested in follow up, uh, everyone has graciously agreed that they would be more than happy to be sounding boards or or connections for you. So Stephen. Uh, appreciate the time, folks. I really do. Um, I, I would love to have this conversation ad nauseum as long as anybody wanted to have it. Um, and I don't sleep much, so ping me, sincerely. <laughs> um, in the work that I do, um, we, we use information to subjectively and objectively tell stories and connect capital to things that work or are trying to work. We are trying to connect the dots that doers with the funders and use a, a way of information and data to translate so that we can find out where things are need help or what, what kind of capital needs to get to where. So we love the social issues. We love the education, workforce development, any kind of social conversation, but having it centered today with this content, oh man, I, I just appreciate the time and um, look us up. We're doing some pretty cool stuff. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Stephen. All right, moving forward, John Lee, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you can share some information with us about your programs and also uh, your publications here. 
Sure. Um, so they kind of go hand in hand. So the book that you see on the right, Expanding College Access um, for Urban Youth, it really captures the work that we've been doing in VIP scholars for the last 15 years. And a lot of it came from educators and community members asking, how do you all do what you do? And if someone were to pick up a book, could they kind of learn more? And so it talks through a lot of what we do in our program and how. And then the book on your left, All Students Must Thrive. And it really just talks about critical wellness for students, starting from administrators and teachers and educators. And each chapter really focuses on how to create environments that are about critical wellness, whether it's around pedagogy, whether it's around mental health or socio-emotional well-being for our students. So yeah, feel free to connect my contact information. I mean it, feel free to reach out. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Justin. Uh, it's been a pleasure being with this group today. Um, I think the thing that I will point to is if, you know, if anyone's interested in talking about how, you know, school university partnerships can provide support to your school communities, I'd love to um, be a thought partner with anyone and have those conversations. Um, I think, you know, in, a, in an age where you know, resources are limited. Um, the more collaborative efforts that, that we engage in, the more impact that we can have to support our students. Uh, so that's the work that I've been doing um, at UCLA for the last 22 years. Um, you know, I, I work with a wonderful group of people and, and would love to, you know, talk to anyone who's interested in, in finding out more about how those partnerships can work and be effective for your students. And then the other thing I'd point to really quickly is, um, as a as a passion of mine, I am a strengths coach. Um, I believe, you know, and it kind of goes hand in hand with kind of the end of that conversation that we were just having. Um, everyone comes to the table with some talents and strengths. Um, what often gets missed is we mislabel them. Uh, people don't know that what they have are strengths. They don't operate in the fullness of, of the strengths that we all have. Um, and so, you know, I love to do professional development or individual coaching around um, strengths and, and getting people to work as optimally as possible. Thank you so much, Justin. We're honored to have you on the panel. And finally, Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about the great work you're doing at Green Dot. Yeah, you know, I, I've been in this role, uh, I've been at Green Dot for public schools for 17 years and have been in my most recent role uh, as Senior Director of African American Achievement um, and Equity for about eight months and have developed a comprehensive uh, plan and approach that is very much strengths-based. And I've already talked to Dr. Patterson about that. Um, and so I'm just looking for and excited to collaborate with um, individuals who are looking for a good trouble, if you will, um, and can assist in uh, helping me amplify the brilliance um, of our African-American students. I'm very thankful uh, that I had the opportunity to be with you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists, uh, Randy and Jacob, do we have any final thoughts? Randy, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Um, I'd just like to, to say uh, a thank you to all of the panelists and uh, Jess to you and Jacob as well. Uh, this, is, this has been very, very exciting and your insights are awesome as well as your, your willingness to share uh, personal experiences to, to link uh, those together. Uh, we're, we are deeply grateful for your time and we look forward to the next conversation. Thank you all so, so very much.